Benvenuti alla scuola enologica Umberto I. Siamo nella sala degustazione storica della, della scuola che ospiterà stamattina eh, una, un intervento del duo Cooking Sections eh, che nella prima parte della, della loro comunicazione presenteranno una ricerca e nella seconda parte invece avremo una conversazione con Alessandro Ceretto che è parte appunto della uh, cantina Ceretto, de de della famiglia Ceretto dove siamo stati anche ospiti ieri sera visitando la, la cappella alla Morra e niente, quindi lascio la parola ai, ai cooking sections, grazie. We are late, late to arrive, late to realize, late to act. Um, Pravoslav Rada and Jan Kotick would not arrive late today because of the complications to get a Soviet uh, visa to travel from the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic to Alba as they experienced in 1956. Today, perhaps, they would arrive late after choosing to slow down and take a train from London all across France, under the sea, above the mountains, to Alba and avoid flying, to decelerate and understand how climate is disrupting the perception of boundaries, of distances and landscapes in our minds. This is the story of what they encountered along the way. The year had no summer, and even the sea has lost its shore. Sure, for sure. When the Sun King recognized it was important to know how big his kingdom was, his cartographers realized that the water was closer than imagined, that the ruler was wrong, that the stars did not align with the sun, that this land had to be redrawn, and that these borders had to be tightened. Measurement made France smaller than it was. Never before had an enemy taken as much territory from the sun as his own geographers did. By correcting the shoreline of France into a new map, he saw the extent of his sun shrink. By drawing the real size of his dominion, he imagined how France could become another idea of France. By enclosing, enclosing its soil and subjects more accurately, he made them more easily taxable. In this corrected map of the French coastline, land was stretched, compressed, entrenched. River estuaries <coughs> silted up on paper, and some of today's most famous wine regions were displaced further inland to a space closer to reality than to the national imaginary. But the sea level did not rise. It was there as before. It was the feeling of boundedness that was transformed. Boundaries are images drawn into our brain. There are lines full of semantic contradictions, full of images and laws, full of labors and dreams. On the frontiers of France, the shore proved not to be a fixed object, but the dynamic set of relations. Connections, triangulations, transmutations, alienations, transubstantiations, perceptions of fragments of a nation. Like the divide between land and water, today the frontiers of climatic zones are also moving. And in their movement, both the heat from the sun and the frontier begin to fade. After the sun was pushed to recognize his surroundings, the sun is pushing us to recognize the changes in territories terroir. 
food territories are no longer those static illustrations that Victor Levasseur used to thrust foods on the national imaginary of French regional culture in the 1850s. He depicted regions bounded by an abundance of grapes and barrels and bottles and vines. But these regions do not overlap any longer. Wine has ceased to taste like the map. Now it tastes like a south-facing slope, like grapes overexposed to the sun. Wine tastes like a hot July. Circa 1860, the phylloxera insect began to decimate European vineyards. When the first signs of blight appeared, no one dared to burn the precious but contaminated plants. Only a decade later, swelling on leaves signaled disaster. Thousands of plants died and died. Phylloxera spread across the continent. Insects transgressed the boundaries drawn by humans on maps. The sun conditions environments. The sun burns. Sun ripens. Sun grows. Sun dries. Sun heats the very thin surface of the soil. Sun accumulates heat and transforms particles. The security of territorial boundaries is a modern invention. While a feudal sovereign demarcated and protected the borders of his territory, modernity fixed those borders through treaties and laws, marriages and wars. The main preoccupation was to ensure the circulation of capital through them. But instead of understanding borders as, a, as the circulation of capital, capital has become the circulation of borders, of shorelines, of climatic frontiers. Nature has turned into a mobile contour of expropriation, deregulating climate, constant flux. The phylloxera crisis motivated landowners in southern France to plant vineyards on the other side of the Mediterranean to continue the colonial project. A complex amalgamation of the nomadic Tamazight and sedentary peoples had been bounded as Algeria, Al Jazeera. South became north, renamed, reoriented towards wine, re-Mediterraneanized. But wine did not have use value for people. It was a commodity with an exchange value for colonial profit. Algeria, Al Jazeera, became a testbed for viticulture and it marginalized local forms of agriculture that did not interest the phylloxera struck metropole. The exploitation of Helahin Local farmers reduced them to landless peasants at the service of the vineyard owners. The vinification of the northern coast of Africa underdeveloped the country at the same time that it impoverished the soil. With the help of pasteurization to stabilize wine in the North African coast, and with the help of foreign investment capital, Algeria, Al Jazeera, quickly grew into the one, in one of the world's largest exporters of wine. Wine creates displacement, not only of humans, plants, and boundaries. Those geographies and origins, those, are, those originalities, cannot keep up with human law, as the earth itself has become the paysan. The soil is using the climate to push us away. 19th century French wine producers in Northern Africa were subsidized by the French state. They were tax exempt. Phylloxera survivors on the old continent started to recover, to complain about imbalanced competition. The shortage of wine laid to fraudulent blends. Alderating wines with water or sugar became common practice in the early 1900s. The colonial imbalance of power, of quality, of price across the Mediterranean led to a dramatic drop in the quality of wine and eventually to the 1907 wine growers' revolt in Languedoc. A struggle between watery delusion and the illusion of authentic wine. The colonial viticulture project to fight phylloxera fixed the borders of regional identity, protectionist and paternalist structures of origin and quality. To avoid watered down wine, they imposed the notion of terroir, laws for the control of origin, 
rules to prevent wine from one Mediterranean contaminating wine from the other same Mediterranean. Facing shorelines drifted away from each other and the Mediterranean was no longer one Mediterranean. The 1907 Wine Rebellion nurtured political regionalism in southern France and encouraged a conservative understanding of landscape protection. It pushed wine country closer to the European continent. Who was entitled to produce what and how and when? Origin became quality, suddenly regions and produce became inseparable. The placefulness of placelessness, a system that evolved into the protected designation of origin, of a controlled origin, an official designation of boundaries to be trusted and others to mistrust. Champagne is to Champagne as Bordeaux is to Bordeaux, as Barolo is to Barolo. The appellation, appellation d'origine contrôlée or protégée emerged as a juridical concept for the demarcation process. Which plants belong to a branded region and which do not? Which properties belong to an original village and which do not? Which sun heats which grapes? Which clouds water which vines? Which soils and sediments are part of a historic vineyard and which are not? But it is the outbreak of phylloxera that tells us that the true origin of origin is in the deracination of the rootstock. When settler remains foreign to the territory that has been conquered, the act of uprooting plants and displacing people is lethal to the subjugated population. To control population through the spread of a plant, to reorganize the political landscape through wine frontiers, to put the colonial roots of geography and cartography at the service of the state. Shortly after Algeria, Al Jazeera, gained independence from France, a new French law forbade blending French and Algerian wines, forbade blurring the origin. And the wine frontiers were again washed off the shore. The southern Mediterranean smells bad, too sweet, too alcoholic to the French tongue. These are the cultures rooted in the Mediterranean soil and climate. On this map, shores are not drawn by the water, they are drawn by the sun what can grow and what cannot grow. The sea ends where the Mediterranean vineyards and date palms stop. But these limits of the Mediterranean envisioned by Fernand Brodel might no longer work today. The sea between Europe and Africa is no longer defined by the northernmost vineyards and the southernmost date palms. Rising temperatures makes the shores of the climatic frontiers fluctuate. Winters become longer, Summer is increasingly hotter. In some years, grapes are more al alcoholic. In others, they do not ripen. Wine harvest starts three weeks earlier than three decades ago. Champagne buys land in England to plant grapes in an uncertain future. And in a decade or two, we may all be celebrating with a glass of Kent. Paler wine if there is a lot of rain, higher sugar and alcohol content if there is a lot of sun. The southern side of the river produces different wines from the northern bank. Misty wines depend on fog from the river. Vineyards reorient from southerly slopes towards less sunny north-facing hills. Not only climatic regions have been trapped by the definition of their limits. Plants have historically been subjugated to increase productivity through order and subordination. Branches attached to ropes, ropes attached to sticks, and sticks stuck into the ground. Vines that bend upon themselves. Land that reorganizes its contours to serve them. Describing wines today as from the new world stigmatizes competition from the colonial other overseas places that used to be under European political control and once again threatened the metropole's original quality. Today, the global warming wines of Chile and Australia, models of heat resilience, are affecting the traditional markets of the former old world. Fear of the disappearance of cultures overcome by the other, as protection, they fortify a differential power. The wine tastes like hot July. But rather than reading it through weather, heat, or drought, 
we still refer to flavors in wine through smoke, grasses, and forest fruits, and roses, and citrus, pretending that substances are sightless and temperatures beyond words, pretending that quality can keep up with origin, that the language of food can absorb a language of change, that common root words are words of mouth, obsolete. In 2003, there was a heat wave. <clears throat> Another one in 2015. You sense it in liquid grapes and solid milk. You open wine and it smells of heat. It tastes of drought. It does not embody rain, if only it bothered to rain. Take a sip. It tastes like the quick ripening of the grapes, like overexposure to the sun. It tastes like snow in April, like frost in September. Some associate the birth of human language with climate adaptation, as depicted on the painted river stones found in a cave in the Pyrenees 14,000 years ago. After centuries of portraying animals, figurative images stopped and abstraction appeared. It was not yet a language of change, but a language of signs that appeared because of environmental change. Contrary to the belief that nomadism produced figurative images and that sedentary societies produced abstraction, it might have been the warming of the Pyrenees that led humans to abstraction long before they settled down. These painted shapes are still an enigma. For some historians of writing, the stripes and dots are the first steps towards a new written language, one that originated from how temperature increases affected cognition. Anthropomorphism turned alphabetic form, signs without words, smells that could describe the changing climate. Some indigenous people still speak with the complexity of smells. To name odors to them is as easy as to name any color. Picture this, your smelling words the smell of illness, the perfume of pain, the smell of function, the smell of danger and blood, the smell of fear, cold sweat, the smell of change, the smell of delicious, the smell of edible, the smell of hygiene, the smell of rancid, the smell of urine, the smell of sex, you smell taboo, pleasure, disgust, you name the odor. The moment we stopped foraging, we began to lose our sense for naming smells. The moment shepherds stopped their nomadic grazing up the mountains, fermentation became more standard. We flattened our olfactory sense when we reduced our vocabulary for synthesizing fragrances into images of memories of visual projections. Our olfactory system no longer, is no longer built to identify odors, we associate flavors with foods we might have eaten in the past. We can only sense the exceptional and we can only detect the misfit. We do not know how to verbalize forms of non-life that keep changing. Terroir needs a new language, one that the sun speaks. As the designation of origin has lost control, we need a lexicon that uncontrols the nation of origin in a changing climate. Bordeaux is anywhere 21 degrees in August, anywhere with eight centimeters of precipitation in May. Either grapes are watered, vines replanted, wine re degreed borders merged, laws passed and repassed, or words rephrased to loosen our minuscule cultures and tighten their macroeconomic tones. To think of a cultural heritage with an expiration date and relax human construction of terroir in the climate of total submission. I wonder what the weather is like, whether it is at all. The myth of the map is dying under the sun. The wine tastes like a hot July.
So after we manage <laughs> to cross the channel and the mountains and arrive here, late but arrive, we wanted also to include Alessandro, which is a, a, an owner of a vineyard and a winemaker here in the region, and to also think about how climate change is kind of changing the landscape around us and various factors that are included today and pressures that are changing practices, flavors, and the way we relate to wine and territory. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Alessandro Ceretto, uh, managing uh, the vineyard and making the wine uh, in, uh, in my winery, my family winery. Uh, of course, uh, the climate is changing, and uh, we have to find a, a new solution Actually, uh, I started to make wine in 1996, and I consider for here, 1996, the turning point where uh, before we were making uh, the, uh, how do you say, cold weather wine, and where today we have to produce the hot July, uh, July uh, wines. It's, uh, it's really true, and uh, we are facing it. I think uh, the only problem is that uh, living in a small territory, you understand this much more uh, after and further where, how do you say, uh, you can uh, um, understand it. Because uh, in, 1990, in 1996, the, warm, the first warm vintage was, oh, it's a warm vintage. In 1997, oh, another warm vintage. In 1998, oh, it's three years in a row that we have a warm vintage. Always considering that normal was, uh, you know, rain in September and uh, cold weather. And uh, I think still today, after 20, 25 uh, harvest, there are still people that they consider that warm is not normal, where probably uh, the warmth and the, the hot is uh, becoming uh, something that we have to face every year. And then we have vintages like uh, 2014, or the vintage like uh, uh, today, that we are facing in 2019, that it's again a little bit uh, wet and cold, so mixes every, uh, everything uh, again to confuse, uh, uh, you know, the understanding of a, of a grower or a farmer, uh, how to approach, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, the farming and, and the viticulture. Well, um, before 1996, I always say that uh, for my father to reach 14 alcohol was really difficult. After 1996, to stay below 14, it's almost impossible. Uh, the ripening, uh, um, you can see in 80s and 70s, uh, picking day uh, in Barolo was middle of October. In 2017, uh, uh, I think there was no one berry left uh, on the 26th of September. And uh, when uh, I finished my study, I travel around the world to make, uh, because the wine business is fantastic. You know, it's exchanging and you can go everywhere to, to learn and to see how they do it. And uh, I was proud to say, oh, my vineyard in Castiglione Falletto, one of the vineyard, it's been picked uh, for probably the same day, one day, two day plus or less for the past 20, 30 years where you go in Australia and you can pick a vineyard the 15th of February and the year after the 15th of March. That for us, one month uh, was uh, something uh, insane. And so I was a little bit proud to say, oh, I'm in, in the right spot where to produce wine. Today, we, we can have uh, two weeks normal. Uh, it's normal to, you know, to move from one vintage to the other uh, um, you know, in two weeks' time. And here we cannot irrigate. So um, some places in uh, like the most, most traditional area in, uh, in the world, like in France, uh, and, uh, and here you cannot irrigate. So you have to face uh, the climate uh, as it is and try to, you know, to, to, to fight against it, even if it's almost, uh, almost impossible because uh, the trellises system is decided when you plant a vineyard. Um, you can, uh, you can interact with the sun, but the sun is the most influent, uh, how do you say, the, the thing that influences most uh, the ripening. And uh, when you get to uh, 
how do you say, I always talk like uh, warmth is a path that you cannot go back. So if you get to a ripening in August, you will never have the uh, chance to wait some, some rain or something to, to go backwards. So uh, the sun burns, how do you say, all the steps. And once you get there, you cannot go behind. And the only thing that you can do is to start to produce uh, different wines, mm -hmm. more alcoholic, more sweet, mm -hmm. more uh, approachable. Yeah, probably the good thing about uh, hot wines is they are, uh, how do you say, looking better when they're young. The problem in an uh, area like uh, Barolo, or talking about uh, Nebbiolo, is that we produce wine to age, to drink them uh, when they are 10, 15, 20. So what we are producing now is are great wines to drink young, but we don't know, touching wood, uh, if they can last uh, uh, for uh, many, many decades, as it is uh, used to be. I think it's fascinating this question also, because for us, wine in a way is almost like a psychogeographic map of the territory, in a way it summarizes all these different subjective perceptions of what is happening. So maybe you could talk a bit about also the kind of new ways of dealing with plants themselves, like through the production of biodynamic wine or other practices, and how do we relearn how to grow plants almost from scratch? Well, in a traditional uh, area, the boundary are set, so, uh, and the rules are set. So um, variety in the Barolo can be only in a Biolo. Uh, you cannot plant north or uh, you know, where you can plant uh, is set. You cannot go below a certain uh, height on the sea level and you cannot go above uh, some. Uh, so if you talk about a uh, small uh, area, it's really, you know, it's uh, really impossible to find a solution. You can find some you know, tiny solution like uh, of course, uh, um, we are trying to plant uh, in uh, a less, uh, how do you say, sun exposure. So probably what was the best vineyard in 1970 and 80 was like a high, full south. Uh, uh, actually, that period, my father was always saying, um, if you have to buy a vineyard, just look in the winter or in the spring, where is the first snow going away? Mm -hmm. So that was a really simple uh, way to understand. That means that the soil drains water, you get better sun, it's warm, and in a 70, 60, 80, where the problem was the ripening, that was the perfect spot where to you know, grow a vineyard. Today is the opposite. Uh, mainly when you get these really, really, really uh, hot vintages, like uh, 2000, 2001, 2003, where you want to escape the sun, so uh, probably in those vintages, the best vineyard were not the best, uh, best wine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, and then uh, of course, uh, before uh, water is the, how do you say, the starting point of any disease because the disease in the, in the agriculture are made by mushrooms, m most of them. So where you have wet and humidity, you have mushroom. So raining in September and October uh, was a problem. And before, we were leaf plucking. So taking away leaves to get them into the sun. So if the rain was arriving, wind and sun could, uh, you know, uh, how do you say, uh, dry up and not having the problem. Uh, today is the opposite. You have to leave the leaves because uh, if it rains uh, today, it will rain uh, half an hour, one hour. So it will be a better, a better thing uh, rather than, you know, uh, what was in the 80s, a, a rainfall could, be, could last five days. And in five days, when the, uh, when the grapes are ripe, you get to totally rot, uh, so you lose completely the, the production. Mm -hmm. Probably the only big problem today is that the climate change uh, gets more to um, thunderstorms, Instead of having uh, huge rainfall, you have thunderstorms. And here, thunderstorm is, uh, means, oh, for the first five minutes, hail. Hail is canceling, totally destroying a, a, a crop. So that today is the, mm -hmm. but the good thing about hail is like, it's the first five minutes. So mm -hmm. it's a really small area 
where uh, the first rain arrived in its ice. As soon the rain drops down, the temperature uh, drops, and the ice become uh, uh, back uh, uh, water, so it doesn't uh, affect. Mm -hmm. So here, because we have a lot of vineyards but spread out in, uh, in Bordeaux, you have one chateau and 100 hectare around. In Barol, it's like Burgundy, you have one chateau, but then the vineyard is one hectare uh, at 10 kilometers, uh, one hectare in, an, uh, in another, and this is our solution to hail. Mm -hmm. It will always hit something, but not the total uh, surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also I think in that regard, it's interesting to think about exactly kind of the scale of industry, right? And like scale of vineyards. And I think what you're already saying here, that the fact that people have, you know, as a way to protect themselves, have demarcated or kind of disseminated their vineyards over like many many like hills and properties and different slopes also how do you see kind of the differences between like large-scale um, producers versus small-scale and also questions of resilience right towards like small-scale and large-scale and where who is more vulnerable today to climate change large-scale is not uh, they don't care they just buy in another place. They don't own land. They, this is why people is planting in Kent, uh, you know, the new champagne, champagne, because larger scale, they just need the, something to market, and there is no solution. And uh, um, in 96, my first vintage was in uh, Australia. And there was this uh, way of saying that every 24 hours in 1997, sorry, they were opening a new winery in Australia. 20, 20 years after, there was no more opening because, uh, because of the climate change, because of the big numbers that they were moving away. Because in 1996, probably there was no wineries. The land was cheap. We opened there because me has a big uh, brand. I can buy grapes. I can produce wine for less money. When, uh, you know, after uh, a huge number of, uh, and there's no more land, or probably it becomes more expensive, they just moved. So the new world of wine moved away. So from Australia, moved to South Africa. Uh, in two, three years, it moved to Chile, to Argentina, uh, trying to find the same, uh, uh, how to say, uh, uh, condition. Condition, so. also because uh, over there you can irrigate. You know, the biggest uh, uh, solution to to the sun and to the drought is the irrigation. But you know, you don't find any more water in the Andes. So mm -hmm. Argentina. Mm -hmm. If you want to buy a vineyard, and you have to have a, a how do you say the way, the pozzo? Uh, well. Well, yeah. that has a, a, you know, you buy, you can buy the vineyard. If it doesn't have a well, there's no, uh, you know, there's no way to irrigate, so there's no, mm -hmm. uh, it, mm -hmm. the land doesn't have a, any value. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very okay. good. Okay. Unless there are any questions from anyone. Yeah, in many ways, I mean, I think it's a whole other chapter, but there's also a whole relationship of how basically the routes that were sent from France to the US to start like a new frontier of wine, basically then were the ones that brought back. So like American wine, like wine, wine routes were the ones that kind of restarted the whole French wine industry later on. Yes, this it has. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it has many kind of stage iterations and. Well, by the end of the 19th century, as you know, it became in France, in Long Jolly, yeah. and then in the south of France, one of the most dramatic you know, uh, inflict which uh, we ever had in the history of the new society. Yeah. So 
we were talking to a historian of Appellation d'Origine Controlée, and he's been looking into all these documents for like years in France. And basically he traces back to um, that moment of the wine revolts in, in southern France, in Languedoc, when there was this competition, and at some point the wine coming from Algeria was m more in terms of amount, uh, but also uh, as good as the one produced in southern France. So there was this tension between the two sides of the Mediterranean to the point that it pushed to create these associations like the Appellation, that what would later become Appellation d'Origine Controlée. And certified. Certified that it's from Languedoc and not from Algeria. Uh, and there was this constant tension between what is French wine, what should not be French wine, um, because of this kind of uprising from uh, Languedoc. and then when the palm dies, 